Welcome to the Relatable Oklahoma Realtors Podcast, the show that sets out to demystify the world of real estate. Whether you're a first-time home buyer, investor, or realtor with years of experience, this is where real estate is discussed and explained. Join me now for our hosts, Stacy and Merle Stricker. Of course. I'm Merle. This is Stacy Stricker. Well, we're here with Blaine. Hey, Blaine. Blaine Holt. Blaine Holt with Cross Country Mortgage. I have a friend that's named Greg Holt. Are y'all related? <laughs> I don't think so. It's a big family. We could be. Yeah. Maybe. Shout out to Greg. I'm sure he's listening. But I have your Greg long distant. Yeah. I have your long distant cousin here. And I. Yeah. So good. He does insurance. Yes. Oh, so, Blaine, you and your wife are. Uh, Mortgage broker? Is that the right term? Uh, loan officers. Loan officers. Yeah. Okay. Can you explain to me how you, or explain to us how you got into that and what attracted you to that and what made you want to do it? Well, that'd be a really long story, but to keep it short, I uh, just was looking for a career change, basically, and I believe it was God's hand in it. What did you do before this? I uh, worked in the oil field. I worked ran casing for frank's tong service for 10 years mm-hmm. and then wanted out of that desperately and the owner of community mortgage gave me a shot at it yeah. being a loan officer so yeah. how long have you been doing it now 18 years now was kathy already doing it yeah kathy was already working there as a closer she was a closing department okay mm-hmm. so she was already in the industry yeah and she had just started. She oh. had not long had started, and then I came along. What did Kathy do before? She ran the flea market on Penn, Pennsylvania, and Northwest Tenth. She managed that and wow. ran all, took care of all the vendors. And I mean, you guys went a completely different direction, yeah. both of y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's cool. So you know, Blaine, why would someone use a mortgage? Lender, why would they use that instead of going down to their like local bank? Why yeah. do you think that they should call you? Question. Um, I, you know, I think the most important thing there is pay structure. The loan officer at the bank is getting an hourly wage or a salary, and if they close a loan, sometimes they'll get a little bonus mm-hmm. or something like that. But with me and Kathy. It's completely, we have to close the loan to make any money or we don't make any. I mean, so it's our whole, entire household income is based on getting the loan closed. Commissioning. Like Commission, yeah, very like a realtor. Yeah. I mean, the short amount of time that I've dealt with buyers, I like, to me, it sounds like an easier process. I, well, let me put it, I don't know about easier, but it just seems like you can help them through the process more than maybe a local bank would or could. Yeah, yeah, I'm certainly more interested in helping them and getting them closed and, and making sure they're happy so that they'll refer me. The loan officer at the bank is, um, they got, you know, if it doesn't work out, that's okay. They're still getting paid. I do feel like, and I've worked with Blaine and Kathy ever since I've been out here. Blaine was one of the first people I met. He just happened to be in the office that day. So look, look back up. Blaine lives in Piedmont, which is in the Oklahoma City metro area, mm-hmm. but also has an office mm-hmm. here in Elk City. And he works, he'll service anywhere in Oklahoma, but comes out here at minimum once a week. When, right? Yeah, minimum. Minimum, yeah. yeah. A lot of times two to three. Yes. And same with his why. I think that's pretty important because it's easy to like, even when I said it, and I'm thinking, don't we want to use local? But you are local in the sense of you live in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. You have an office here. You're not office next to each other for, for the home care. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not, you know, if you pick one of the major banks that you may you know, do a car loan through or a mortgage through, those things are not an Oklahoma company. Right. They are not, you know, those people are, you know, from Oklahoma and live but, in Oklahoma. Yeah, like when you use a national lender and... Um, and I, you know, I'm not saying I'm not knocking anybody, but when you use a national lender, you get passed off quite a bit. Yeah. So when I've worked with Blaine and Kathy, I'm working with Blaine and Kathy. Um, and what I really like is I can talk to them any time of day. We're not mm-hmm. boxed into a nine to five Right. Mm-hmm. Time. Which everything happens after nine to five or before nine to five. Yeah. Um, and every loan 
is not easy. Most loans are not easy. Right. It's more now, it's more common to have difficult, right? Wouldn't you mm-hmm. say? So it's like along the way or, you know, a buyer will call and they're stressed out about something. And, you know, it may be seven, eight o'clock at night and you're having to, you know, kind of talk them off the ledge and like, okay, hang on. Let me reach out to Blaine or Kathy and see if I can get a hold of them real quick or, you know, whatever. And so that's nice to, as a realtor, to have that kind of relationship Mm -hmm. with the lender. Yeah. You know, Blaine, I was actually pretty excited to talk to you because I wanted to talk about closing costs. We, I've been dealing with that lately with a, you know, potential buyer that, you know, I've bought several properties in the past and I never even considered closing costs as a subject. I'm talking about investment properties, personal home, business stuff. Mm-hmm. I never even thought about closing costs. So like if you take a BA loan, as an example, it's kind of known, especially if you're a veteran, but it, in, in the industry, it's known that you would not, the, the the good thing about that is you have no money down kind of situation. And so, of course, that attracts potential buyers to using that type of loan. But truly, there is closing cost. And mm-hmm. part of like what I'm dealing with now is trying to negotiate those closing costs, whether the seller is going to pay the closing cost. So you, if you have a VA situation, let's say a $200,000 you know, loan, there's still substantial closing costs that has to be figured out and dealt with. Mm-hmm. And the first thing my buyer said to me was, can't we roll that into the note? Can you explain a little bit better the closing cost and how that works? I was actually surprised by it. Yeah, uh, that's a good question because right now the mortgage environment, uh, banks, uh, some are taking a different route. Uh, our rate, like mine, is around six and a half, seven, right in there with no discount points. Uh, buyers need to be aware of that. It can make a huge difference. A discount point is 1% of the contract sales price. And what people don't understand on discount points, I'm going to speak in layman's terms, that's to buy down. Supposed to buy down the rate. So when you hear a lender say, and they got a really low rate, they're well, like I said, I'm around six and a half, seven in that ballpark right up in there. If they're talking about five, six, even, they're more than likely charging you a discount point and you should ask. So back to the example of a 200,000 loan. If I want, and let's say it's at 6%, that's where we're at for fairly even, even Mm -hmm. numbers. For interest rate. If I want to buy down one interest point or one interest percent, Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to have to pay one percent of the two hundred thousand, two thousand dollars, and that doesn't buy the rate down a full point. That just gets you a discount on the rate. It's not buying it down a full percent. Okay, not usually just a half a point. Yeah, it's usually about a half or a quarter. Yeah. Does, that, does every lender do those kind of things, or is that certain lenders do it? What's yeah, it just depends on the route they want to take. Like they'll, they're trying to make their money on the front end on fees instead of it's on the rate. All mortgage banks make their money when they sell the loan. Bank, mortgage banks can't exist. They can't fund billions of dollars of mortgages and sit on it for 30 years. Right. You know, so you have to sell them. The secondary market is what we're talking about. And even local banks do that. You know, they'll. Yeah, I think there's a big, big misconception that if you got a mortgage from the local bank that it's going to stay with their local bank. That right. is definitely not true. Not no. Service it. no. Yeah. yeah. I was going to mention that when we were talking about keep it local, because I mean, it's, it is kind of, I'm just as uh, like a local loan officer. I come out here and spend a lot of my money, Yeah. you know, and, but other than that, the bank's going to get it and make a, it's a yield spread premium. They sell it. It's called the yield spread premium and they sell it to a servicing company that just services the loan. That's all they do. They don't do mortgages. They have banks that are just for servicing. They buy mortgages and that and they'll sell that to them, the the paper and so basically what the bank does is like you'll package them up. I don't know how often they do it. Yeah, so, they'll sell them in a in a package. package. So yeah. like say here's a whole package of all these people are FHA loans with what do they say? Like seven hundred plus credit score and this package of loans will get sold. Do they break them yeah. up like that? Um, no, I think it's more along the lines of here's $10 million worth of loans, and they're all different kinds. You know, the, yeah. because they'll want to service all. It doesn't matter. A servicing company doesn't just service FHA loans. They want all of them, VA, conventional, everything. So those buy a big bundle of them. Yeah. And most of the time, the loan is sold before their first mortgage payments even do. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and some have their own servicing company. Like when I worked for uh, a previous mortgage company, I won't mention any names. <laughs> we had our, uh, we did both. Yeah. So, I don't think it was an advantage for us, yeah. though. But I think like closing costs, like a lot of times buyers, like we really have to walk them through that. And Blaine, you and Kathy do that too. Like, okay, are you aware that? So let's go back to this two hundred thousand dollar house. Your closing costs are going to be a approximately seven thousand dollars without points right and that and those closing costs include meaning the closing costs would go up if you're going to actually buy down points if you're going to right right so if you add points to that yes it will go up but just without points about seven thousand dollars and that includes your prepaids too Right. Yeah, sixty five so hundred. I'm guessing around sixty five hundred. Yeah. Once you explain like what all of that closing costs. Well, and like Burrow was saying, the closing costs. So what you would do on a like the VA loan for two hundred thousand dollars, you could uh, give the seller a full price offer and ask them to pay your closing costs. I mean, most people list their house expecting to be asked to come down. Right. And don't ask them to say, hey, I want you to pay my closing costs. You know, it's a $200,000 loan. So you're essentially asking them to come down $6,000. Yeah. Well, and then buyers or sellers both are like, oh, my gosh, why are those closing costs so high? Well, it really includes their prepaids, which is a mm. year's worth of insurance. And then you also have to have Property in tenant. reserves and, ins- you know, three more Mortgage months. insurance is a part of re- escrow. Yeah, so I, I cannot. I mean, I... When we talk about the subject, especially Stacy, you and I have talked about it, and I've seen it enough through training and working with you, and 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 I mean, it really, to me, it is a kind of a shock because I, I see I saw a sign just recently of a local bank here that's offering home loans, a mortgage for no money down. It's a big old sign advertisement on the door, and but that's not completely the truth. I mean, it's not that they're misleading necessarily, but it's like. What is not factored in there is there's a potential of the closing cost. So if I go back and I'm we're this is a two hundred thousand dollar house, and let's say that we say, hey, we'll give you two hundred thousand plus if you'll pay the closing cost, then really we're asking that seller to drop their price by seven thousand dollars in that mm-hmm. particular case. And and I don't think those things are discussed or talked about or understood by right. most people. Well, and that's why it's important. Like when you visit with a lender, like Blaine and Kathy will work up a fee sheet and tell you, okay, this is the interest rate you qualify for. And then us as realtors, <laughs> Blaine and I were just talking about this before you got here. He's like, I don't know why you guys have to do these forms because we're obligated to fill one out and us is disclosing fees. Well, we're not in charge of those fees as realtors, but we have to fill it out to yeah. disclose it. Yeah. And it's usually the most challenging form for a new realtor to yeah. grasp. For yeah. sure. I'm having a whole time, you know, really grasping. I get the concept of it. But like in this particular case, you know, one of our offers is that we're going to ask for closing costs, but we only ask for a certain amount. And you realize they still have to bring money to the table in that scenario, if it was exactly right. right. I think one of the things that's overlooked a little is, you know, even if you're going to do one of those deals, you're going to ask the, the seller to pay your closing costs and all that. You can put down $500 earnest money or put down $1,000 earnest money and uh, pay for your appraisal. That's money you get back at closing. So mm-hmm. let's say you put down $1,000 of earnest money and the appraisal was $650. You know, so what are you coming in? To like, so now you have a $1,750 credit at closing. Mm-hmm. So, and you take that into consideration when you're, you're going to ask the seller to pay closing costs because this, I'm going to have a $1,750 credit. So maybe I don't need seven. Maybe mm-hmm. I can get by with 55. You know, so if you're in an environment where you're having to bid against somebody, that will come in handy. Right. Don't ask for as much. Don't ask for as much and put down more earnest money, appraisal. I think your home inspection comes back to you as well. Um, yeah. Depending on how much. But you require that they, and almost all lenders, you have to pay for your appraisal up front. So the yeah. buyer pays for that. Um, some inspectors will give you a the discount. Bu- if the you buyer pay. pays for the appraisal until closing. And then I charge the seller yeah. if it's one of those deals where the seller's paying them. And I'll reward it back to the buyer. Yeah. Blaine, can you like speak to what we what I mentioned about 
uh, a potential buyer thinking that he could roll his closing costs into the note and, mm-hmm. and how that works. And so if they can, didn't ask for it in the offer. Yeah. So in this situation, they, let's say they, the buyer or the seller refuses to, or doesn't want to, or we didn't ask for closing costs. So now it falls on the responsibility of the, of the buyer. So how does that mm-hmm. work? Because I could see how their mentality is, can we roll that into the market? I can tell you about 95% of the time what you do, let's say it's a $200,000 house and they're refusing. That's my bottom line. I'm not paying, you know, I'm not going to take any less than that. And the buyer wants to roll in closing costs. Give them 206 for the house. Give them 206,000, 2,600, 2, 500, mm-hmm. you know, 2,700. Give them the money to get back mm-hmm. in the price of the house. Of course, it has to appraise. For that, but that's really the sticking point that Stacy and I talked about is that it has to appraise mm-hmm. for that amount with the added closing cost as part of. Yes, that. yeah, yeah, but that's how you roll closing costs in. It has to be in the contract. You get you uh, the seller puts it in the contract. You give it to the seller basically, and they give it back. Yeah, and we are running into houses not, and even though we've had our busiest year last year was a record breaking mm-hmm. year, or this year we're still in twenty twenty two. Still crazy year. 2021 was crazy. Homes are still, some of them are still struggling to appraise because sellers are like, no, it's worth it. Well, you may think that, but the appraiser doesn't. Right. So it, it's hard to increase it. Right. The value of the house I is mean, you and I based are doing, on comps. We're doing one right now with Char. Yeah. And the appraisal came in short. And now the buyer's having to come up with their own closing costs because the yeah, seller it can't. can backfire on you yeah. for sure. Mm-hmm. So in in the situation, you and I talked to today, Stacy, about that, you know, like in a VA situation where it's a no money down kind of situation. So they're going to finance 100 percent of the value of the home. Mm-hmm. But I would assume not all loans are like that. I've seen like commercial or like, let's say, an investment where they did like an 80, 20. So you had to have like at least 80 um, percent of the value, they would loan up to 80% of the value and then 20% was expected by the purchaser. So those things are like really gone. Yeah, there's no 80-20s. Yeah. It would be... Even an in 80-20, commercial investment. Well, an 80 20 was, you know, you finance there, the 80% is going to have the first lien and then you'd have a second right. for, you know, a 20%. You'd borrow your down payment. And that was kind of to get away, away from mortgage insurance premiums and... Yeah. So much has changed now where you don't have to do that. So USDA, Blaine can explain this better, but they will loan up to 100% just like VA does. Uh-huh. But you still have, and it's zero down. Yeah. But you still have closing costs. But one thing we were talking about, so, okay, say it's a $200,000 house and they have not negotiated any closing costs. They're like, I'm paying $200,000. i will pay my own closing costs. Say the house appraises mm. for two hundred five. Then can you roll on closing costs? On a USDA, you can use the equity and the appraisal. Can you do that on VA? No, you cannot. I guess you could go back and renegotiate if the seller would do it. You could do an addendum of the contract and renegotiate, but you don't have to do that on USDA. They just let you do it. So USDA is the only one that you can do that without yes. renegotiating. Which yes. when renegotiating is really hard to do after you've already agreed on Right. Yeah, it typically doesn't work. Right. You go back and want to change the numbers just because So only USDA. Well going back to what you said, you said really that's not a thing anymore. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. Eighty twenty property. Well meaning that if I want to go buy an investment property that costs a hundred thousand dollars in the past, and let's say it's it valued at a hundred that because it's based on value, not just on the price. But normally in the past, the bank would say, I'm, again, talking about investment, not home, right. but saying, hey, you got to come up with $80,000 or your world finance up to $80,000 and you you're, you're expected the 20. Yeah. And you're saying that's not a thing anymore? I know, like when Peyton and I bought this building. Now, Blaine, you don't do commercial mm-hmm. loans. So we went um, with a local lender here and mm-hmm. they are locally owned. Um, and so they service all their loans in house. They don't package them up. So they can run things a little bit differently, but they did like, so we did an appraisal on this um, and they said, okay, and well, you want to remodel it, you know, and then we had an appraisal done on what it was going to be after remodel. Mm-hmm. And so we did not have to put any money down on this And it's building. because they appraised higher, really like, I'm throwing out a number, yeah. but 120%, 110% or whatever, which right. included the remodel cost. Right. And, right? Yeah. 
So, and I actually agree with what you're saying because any that's why closing costs also has not come into my brain because um, if I did an investment property, maybe buying an apartment complex or buying anything like that, then the appraisal came in higher, so I didn't need to put down right. a certain percent because they financed you know eighty percent of the appraised value. Right. Mm-hmm. And commercial is different. Investment properties, it is done differently. Yeah. And I know we're not really particularly talking about commercial, but it's just what I was thinking that like with a conventional loan, and really this is my question with a conventional loan, is that is that number like more like 90, 10, you know, 90, 10, mm-hmm. but with like USDA veterans, that's 100%. Is it different with like a conventional loan for buying a home? Yeah, it is. The 80, the 80, 20, it was just for conventional financing when we were doing them. But I mean, they're not available anymore. I mean, the lenders aren't doing them. So you can do a conventional loan with 5% down. Uh, you can do a conventional loan if you're a first time home buyer with 3% down. You just have to have a better credit score. You have to have, yeah, I wouldn't go down the conventional path unless your credit score is in the 700s. Because, and especially if you're not going to put 20% down, because you're going to pick up monthly mortgage insurance. And monthly mortgage insurance is always different on a conventional loan. It's based on your credit score and how much you're putting down. If you're only putting 3% down, it's going to be higher than when someone putting 5 or 10% down. Mm-hmm. And, and another thing on conventional, the seller contribution is all different depending on your down payment. You can, they are, a seller's only allowed to put down, uh, contribute 3% of the contract sales price towards the buyer's closing costs. Um, if all the way up to like 9% down, if that's all you're putting is 9% down, you can only get a 3% seller concession. When you hit 10%, the seller can contribute 6% of the contract sales price towards your closing costs. I think, you know, this conversation t- for me is like, you're, should be going your like biggest selling point because this stuff is complicated. And I mean, even for people who are smart and understand a little, you know, a good base line of, of this kind of mm-hmm. thing, but well, we need. I feel like that, especially a new home buy, a home buyer, a new home buyer, or somebody who's actually done it a couple of times, they need help navigating this because it can yes. get very complicated. Yeah, and that's why I'm here. I mean, I want to mention too on conventional the mortgage insurance, the monthly mortgage insurance will fall off uh, and when you hit an eighty percent loan to value threshold. Once you have twenty percent of it paid down, according to the appraisal, you have it. You have 20% of it paid down, the monthly mortgage insurance falls off of a conventional loan. Where it does FHA, it's there for the life of the loan unless you put like 10% down. If you put 10% down on FHA, it falls off on 11 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which mortgage insurance is a write off on your Oklahoma state tax, you know? So don't get all hung up about it. Right. You need to write it off. I think that's a great point too. And I think that's part of the navigation process that, you know, people need help realizing that, yes. This is costing you now, but it also is a, a yeah. tax deductible. Well, and you really need to look at, which I think is great too, when they visit with you. This is, well, for one, this is why starting to get pre qualified, you have to start there yeah. before you go look. So That's a good one. There was, I got a call yesterday on the way to our Altus office, came through, you know, one of our third party, Zillow. Um, and she's like, I've never done this. Where do I go? And have you talked to a lender? Do you want to do cash? You know, and well, they want to, you know, they want to finance, but where do we start? So gave them Blaine and Kathy's number. Um, and then they call and talk to Kathy and what you need to do is, okay, so this is your first house. More than likely you're going to be in this house five to seven years. Mm -hmm. So do you need to do a conventional loan? Probably not for your first house. It's probably better to do USDA. And this couple qualified for USDA and USDA loan, because, you know, those that are not in our market is income restricted. Mm -hmm. You can't make over a certain amount. I think it's 103000 with one to four. In the I can't house. believe it's gone up that much. It is. I mean, That's it a, it's very like, real. USDA loan is an incredible. It really loan. is. It has cheaper mortgage insurance premium and mo- and cheaper monthly mortgage insurance than FHA. Yeah. And the 184 ending loan. Um, the 184 ending loan is cheaper monthly mm-hmm. by a fraction. It's 0. 0.250. USDA is 0. 0.350. Yeah. I mean, it's so close. So, and, and it's, you know, 100% financing, zero down. Yeah. Um, we're getting some of them in at six uh, with a 600 credit score. 
That's amazing. Well, one of the things she said, I said, well, you really need to talk to a lender. So she had called on a $200,000 house. I said, one, you want to see what you can qualify for. And two, you want to see if you're comfortable with that payment. And she said, well, so is the payment calculator on Zillow not correct? No. Is anything correct on Zillow? (laughs) No. How do I feel about Zillow? You're not Zillow? getting sponsored by Zillow. Oh, my God. Ask I any realtor sure. what they would think about that. So I said, no, it does not include your insurance and your taxes. You know, that whole thing. Mortgage she insurance. Goes, oh, problem. okay. Yeah. So sure enough, she hangs up with me, ends up speaking with Kathy. Guess what they qualify for? Mm-hmm. Guess what? Yeah. Oh, 150. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So $50,000 difference. Mm-hmm. So. You, when we talked about this on that couple you're showing in Lawton, mm-hmm. do I want to go out and show her $200,000 homes to begin with because she thinks that's what they can afford? No, because then she's going to fall in love with the $200,000 house. Guess what? We can't afford it. And then we're going to have to start. Then we're going to go down to a one fifty. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's important to get pre-qualified first. I mean, I think that's... Can't stress that enough. It wastes your the buyer's time and the realtor's time and seller's time. Yeah, you know, I mean, everybody. I mean, you it's, just you just get disappointed. Know how much you qualify for and know what type of mortgage product you're going to be doing. Yeah, you mentioned it with the credit scoring. I get asked this question quite a bit, and I've heard you answer this question, Stacy. It's like my credit is not very good. What do I need to do to you know qualify for a home loan? What's some of your advice to in that situation? Let's say somebody just has in their mind that their credit score is not get, good enough to get a home loan. Or they think and, they know what it is. Well, part of that is that, yeah, they may not even know. But then mm-hmm. I think there's another part of it is they automatically think that they will not qualify for a loan when they possibly could. What's your suggestion to people like that? Yeah, I would say call again, call me first. And if it's not the credit score is not where it needs to be, I have lots of suggestions to help get the scores up. And I was surprised you were working with one potential uh, potential buyer that I was working with. And and really, the fix was in a month or two. It was not, Mm -hmm. you know, a year down the road. That's what most people I think when they think about. And I know there is some bad credit situations out there, but I'm saying the normal Credit situation may be able to be rectified yeah, usually, in a month or two. Yeah, everything happens on the credit report every month, you know. So, and it may not be like it's a no right now. It's like right. It, everything I can we can usually fix things. It just depends on the buyer how much money they have to spend on it. You know, if you can go in and pay all your old collections off, open up a couple new credit cards. I mean, that does a lot. Yeah. Um, I would say, and two, one thing I want to, if you, you know, don't let credit karma. Those are consumer credit reports, okay? If you're having your credit pulled, you're online looking, trying to see where your credit is or whatever, the scores that you're going to see are inflated. There's no financial risk in that pull, whether it be from Credit Karma, TransUnion, Equifax, Experian, wherever the consumer credit report website is you're using, There's it's inflated. The score you're going to see is inflated. There's no financial risk. There's nine different search engines to pull credit. There's mortgages, car financing. You can buy furniture. I mean, it goes on. And each one of those is going to get a different credit score. So it's important. I think, I think to- credit card is, sorry to interrupt, but I think that credit card or credit score is definitely another confusing topic because you're right. You could pull your three major ones, as they call them, TransUnion and and then come up with three different numbers and you're like, yeah. well, which one are they going to look at? And Right. You know, That's a good question. The middle score. The middle. We're going to use the middle. It's not an average. It's just the, all three scores are going to be different most of the time. And uh, we use the middle one. All banks do. And part of that, I think, is what mortgages. Now, I mean, so like I said, you get into different types of financing, they'll start that that'll vary. Like for a car loan, they're going to look at something different. They may use yeah. just TransUnion only. Right. Or so so someone will say, oh, I just bought a car six months ago. Yes. And I looked at my credit and it was a 720. Yeah. Well, they may not have pulled TransUnion. All three they girls, may just they looked at They didn't Equifax. pull it on a mortgage search, too. That's right. going to make a difference. So this is why you get pre-qualified. Exactly. But I think you said that at the beginning that you can help them go, you know, go 
basically go through that process with them and help them understand where Absolutely. they need to be. And and based on, I mean, a higher credit score, does that equal a better interest rate? And, yes. and what would it look like? It's for very them? sensitive right that? now. Yeah, money down and high scores get you a better rate. And it has more impacting it more now than in the past. I mean, it used to be, I mean, you may make a quarter to a half percent. It can make a full point difference. Does that system help you buy a house, help you not buy a house that you can't afford? The whole system that you're talking about? Yeah, like, so Tom talking sense? about like your debt to income ratio. So yeah. they have to go off of that. Yeah, it's debt to income ratio is a, a good credit score, a good high credit score. Well, there are some exceptions on, you know, it'll get you a higher approval on a higher debt ratio, say like a 50. Um, so what's your debt to income ratio that you're allowed to do? Like, well, let's use USDA for an example. It's 29 over 43. So that means you can carry 43% debt. Yeah. So the first number is your gross income divided by 12 times to 29%. And then the second number, the 40 or the 43, is taking into consideration the debt that's on your credit report versus your gross income. And, that's and they look at those two numbers. And the, the lowest number of the two is the house payment you qualify for. Right. Yeah. So it's not when you do a mortgage, it's not just your credit score. It's also your debt, debt to ratio. Income. Debt to income right. ratio is very important. Well, they are looking at income. They're looking at your debt. They're looking at the credit score. Yeah. It's all part of it. So to also share with us, like there's people that are like, nope, I don't want a credit card. I don't want this. So if they have no credit, how do you work with those type of There's a, a loan available for that. Um, USDA will do no scores um, and FHA. I think there's a conventional. I've done a conventional no score, but they come with severe hits to the rate. You'll get charged discount points on those and yeah. um, and a higher rate and higher closing cost fees. So this buyer that Kathy actually talked to for me yesterday, she said she they are also a no credit mm-hmm. and not having to charge a discount. Oh, fee. really? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, that'll happen. So tell me, what do you use? It, you, you may can, be a higher rate because of Maybe a higher rate, but not a discount point. Yeah, that's so incredible, really. That's what she said, too. I think that... She was surprised by that. I she was. Yeah. She was surprised. Kathy was. So you guys use what you call alternative alternative credit. All credit. Yeah, so alternative credit. You get electric, water, gas, car insurance, anything you're making a 12-month pay history on. FHA will require three lines of alternative credit, and USDA will require four lines of alternative credit. But USDA will allow you to count rent. Rent counts as two of those four. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And they don't have to be on your credit report. You just right. have to get proof of these. Yeah. Yeah. Get, get a pay. Yeah. People with no scores can buy for sure. So one thing, I know we've talked about this, but I don't know if we stressed enough because even some of the realtors in our office really didn't grasp it. And you didn't realize this until one or, you came into one of our office meetings is, you know, when we're talking to buyers, like, you know, we're like, hey, you know, you're, you got your pre-qualification. Have you looked at a fee sheet? Don't just say, right. I got quoted this interest rate. Yeah, well, yeah. What are your fees on top of that? Yes. Ask that. That's and the buyer the needs buyer to ask. With right now. Yeah. What that, are your fees? You know, they gave us what they thought it could remember the interest rate was. And then we got the fee sheet and it was much different than we were. Right. I mean, so you end up yeah. finding about that at closing or it's too late. You're already in it. You've already bought an appraisal. You've already put down earnest money and now you're seeing the fees. And so, so now you don't want to back right. out. And as a first time home buyer, they have no idea they have no what these fees are. And then that's where, you know, we're here to help. So, you know, we've been doing it for a long time. And I was telling you yesterday, I was looking at a closing sheet. I was working at one of our files that another realtor in our office had closed. And I was like, what is this? This is a lender I've never personally worked with. Mm -hmm. Their fees were outrageous, outrageous. You know, in us as realtors, you know, we're here to guide them. And, you know, I always tell them like, hey, I just know enough about mortgages to kind of educate. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> point to kind of talk you through it. But then like you really need to talk to the experts. Yeah. But I know enough when I see a fee sheet that there are some crazy charges. But yeah, um, especially right now, there are a lot of them out there. Yeah. Doing that. So we were talking about yesterday and. Um, 
if I have a house for sale, I work mainly with sellers Mm -hmm. on my end and I'm getting, say it's a hundred thousand dollar house. Well, I have um, an offer come through and they're saying they need 7,000 in closing costs. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. Why are those closing costs so high? That person needs to go shop around. Well, Mm -hmm. if it's not my buyer, that's, you know, I'm not involved in that. But I'm telling my seller, (laughs) they're asking for a lot in closing costs. I'm going to tell you that. So I know that that lender is charging discount points. Like I know Mm -hmm. automatically. So I'm telling Blaine that. I'm like, yeah, almost every lender right now is charging discount points. He's like, what? We're not charging discount points. Mm, Right. Yeah. So this is why it's imperative that buyers need to know not every lender, just because interest rates have gone up does not mean every lender is charging discount points. Yeah, discount points are cost thousands. You know, I call yes. it like orientation process, but I think that, that a that a good buyer, if you want to, you know, do you need to do your homework and part of that is working with a, a, a lender trying to decide what those fees are up front. So you know how much your payment potentially could be. So you right. know how much the closing costs potentially be. And I know that that's one of the things you've talked about a lot yeah. is well, like making sure we do that as realtors. To make yes. sure they understand that's that important like to me. That. I think that's one of the reasons I've always tried to lead any buyer sent to me down the right path, whether they end up with me for financing or not. Right. And I believe, and I take it to heart and I do that every single time. And I think that's why I've been in business for 18 years. A lot of loan officers, you, it's it's rare, Mm -hmm. you know, um, it is a very cutthroat industry, just like real estate. Sure. Sure. It is. I just, I think I I managed to make it because I give good advice for, I give advice that benefits the buyer and not myself. Well, and you are able to help people fix their credit. Like, and that's not a fee like, Hey, okay. You are stupid. And (laughs) you don't say it like that, but okay. You missed a mortgage payment, um, 10 months ago. So we're going to have to wait two months before you can buy a house. No big deal. So we're like, oh, and they just think, oh, my gosh, that's two months. No, we can go ahead and go look at houses now. You just ask your realtor, we just need a little bit longer closing date. No Mm -hmm. big deal, but you can't miss anything else. Yeah. I think that you you mentioned this originally when I was, States, when I asked you about, like, why do you like real estate? And you said that I like the opportunity to help people, you know, find their first home, find you know, the home of their dreams. And, and really, I thought it was a great answer because you, you don't always look at real estate like it's an opportunity to help people. And it's, it really is. But on the same point, I think that people have this like preconceived notion about mortgage mortgages and how like the bank's just out for themselves. Realtors, you know, they may just be out for. And, and part of it, like listening to y'all's conversation, it's like part of that you can see why, because, man, this bank char- is uh, charging this many fees and yes. they're having to eat and they don't understand those fees. Um, but I think that we in this industry can actually flip that and be like, OK, we can help you through that process and we can make sure that you're not paying more than you should be paying. Yeah. Whether we're talking about the lending side or where you're talking about the real estate side. And I think that that is important for people to understand it's like if you really have truly have somebody on your side that's looking out for your best interest which is what we should all be doing then they can help you make sure you're not yeah. paying too much or- i will say like i i have a buyer in mind that blaine and i both worked with gosh at minimum six months in the seller he, they were my seller too um They really wanted this house, but they had to dig in deep and do some work on their credit. This has been several years ago, and they got that house for their family. Um, They had two, maybe three kids, but they were thrilled to death when Blaine helped them fix their credit. Mm -hmm. Um, And my sellers were stressed out as when the market had taken a dip and they didn't live here anymore and you know, we had to get this house sold. And so it was a win-win for everybody. But those people that you help with their credit, like, yeah, we've all messed up. I mean, I've screwed up my credit before and, you know, whatever, made stupid mistakes when I was younger. But some people just don't know how to fix it. They're willing to fix it. Yeah, they almost bury their head. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it's not a big deal. And it doesn't take that long to fix it. You just have to be willing 
to do it. But yeah. those people are so grateful. Yeah. Yeah. That's the best advertising for me. Yeah. Those are the people I love to help because, yeah. you know, it's they're going to spread your name. Oh, my gosh. Like at that closing, they were just beyond excited because they never thought they were going to be able to get a house. I think that like in layman's terms and thinking about it, like from the buyers you know, or seller, but in this case, we were talking about mortgages, but from the buyer's point of view, I think that my advice to them was be, would be that you can turn that idea that you have of that everybody's out for themselves, that nobody wants to help. You know, there's nothing better. And you and I've talked about it, Stacey, there's nothing better than like going into the bank to get a loan or something. And you have someone to talk to and you know them and they know you mm -hmm. and you feel like they're working on your side. Yeah. yeah. Whereas you can go into many banks and you can be like, man, nobody here wants to help me. Nobody here wants to, you know, help, help yeah. me navigate this. That's you correct. know, and, and so you have this bad idea. But I'm telling you, you can flip it. It's like if you're kind of if you are interested in buying a home. And you have these questions about credit or you have these questions about closing costs or you have these questions that you can easily go talk to Blaine and say, yes, he can help navigate it. And here's the thing. I believe that you would say, I'm sorry, you're just not going to qualify right now. It's going to be some time, you know, yeah. and there's nothing. Oh, that's always, that if, if they don't qualify right then, I'm, I have advice yeah. every time. And I think that if I was even thinking about purchasing home, if I started there and you said, hey, this is not the right time to do it. This is what needs to happen. That would make me feel a lot better. Yeah. And then I, I, it's like pulling my uh, head out of the sand too and be like, okay, this is a fixable solution. Right. I mean, and there's some that we've worked with that they're like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. And they don't. And they don't. Yeah. And it, sometimes they just can't afford to yeah. do it. And that's okay. But, you know, talking about finances, um, I think it's hard for some people to do that. Yeah. Um, or they get offended when we say, Hey, have you talked to a lender? No. I just want to look at the house first. Like you're looking at me like, like I can't afford it. Me. No, yeah. I'm not judging you. I'm just asking you a question. Yeah. One, well, that's my job. Right. right. So yeah. Um, and that's what I'm here for. So but I think it can really like it goes back to kind of like emotional intelligence. It can help us become more emotionally intelligent to realize, okay, this is where I'm at. This is where I want to be setting a goal and, you know, and really working through that process. But it's something you have to almost like break down those walls of what your preconceived notion is about mortgage lending, about, you know, all that purchasing a home. And, yeah. yeah, I agree. I, I had to fix my own credit. We've all done yeah. it. Yeah. I think that stuff can happen. Uh, I, the biggest one that comes to mind is 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 uh, doctor bills and healthcare. I mean, if you got in a situation where somebody was really sick in your family and you're struggling to make those payments and you know trying to pay off the doctor or the hospital, those things I think we've all had a part of in our life, and so we can say let's work through those what instead see, of just assuming that mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's a no go. What I see most of the time is um, doctor medical bills taxes mm -hmm. or divorce. Yeah. Like those are the, the leading problems to the medical bills lower the score, but they're really not looked at hardly in mortgage but underwriting. Changed, right. The, the, the laws just change on that or they're about to uh, medical. Yeah. They're about to, I yeah. think, I don't think they have yet. I think they change at the beginning of the year. I'm not suggesting that you don't go pay your medical bill, but yeah. Cause like I said, it will affect your score yeah. having it on there. But but not as and, much as well. And under, when you when your loan goes into underwriting, an underwriter looks at that, and and it's not a mortgage bank views it. That's not debt that you went out and acquired and didn't pay. Right. You something happened, and you had to go to the doctor and get well. Right. You know, it, it wasn't a, a debt that was calculated. Yeah. In other words, you didn't make a decision to buy this new yeah. shiny object, and then you just didn't pay it for it. Yeah. You know, which is I could see that's way different. Yeah, sure. it is. Um. I think that's you got to get pre-qualified. I, I think it goes back <laughs> to that, but it's also more than just pre-qualified. It's just like it's good to know where you're at. You know, it's good to yeah. know where you need to go. It is. I mean, what if you're just a few points away from 
being able to get a better rate or something, yeah, you know, sure. the, you wouldn't, you know, you could pay off a credit card and I can repull right before closing and give you the better rate. Yeah. I mean, you don't know until you get pre-qualified for right. it. And it comes, actually something came to mind Blaine, while we're sitting here talking is, do you deal with refinancing as well? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. We do a lot. So I think that that could be, I, I think that's another idea where you, I am not wanting to switch homes, but I want to refinance because maybe they didn't get the best deal mm-hmm. and they're wanting to just wonder if they could get a better deal. They could contact you and you could help them decide if they're sure. better I mean, out there. Yeah, there's a, I think, you know, getting back to, I don't want to just give advice. It just benefits me. Sure. Doing refis, I make more money, but look into a HELOC. You know, if you know, if you do a HELOC, a HELOC is, is a set of initials that stands for home equity line of credit. They, they don't have to redo title work and all that on those. You know, it's a much more economical way to just get a little bit of money out. Mm-hmm. Unless you're needing a, a good, because then a, a, a me, a mortgage bank or anyone else, they're going to have to redo all the title work. Which is includes the closing cost. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, well, it yeah, is the know. closing cost. And now there's no seller involved because when you bought the house, the seller got the abstract brought to date. Now you're and now it. now you have all you have to do everything as a buyer and get all the title work, everything redone. Um, so what's the rule of thumb, right? Like they, for a, a refi, you, you want to save at least some, a point? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I would say, yeah, at least save at least a point on the rate and uh, or a point and a half. And uh, that's probably not going to happen at this moment. Right? No, not right now. Or be in the home and be in the home. What another? Yeah, I would say I would like if I was going to refi, I would want the rate lower and I would want some equity in my house because we can use the equity to cover those closing costs. So you helped me refinance my house after my divorce and we went through the different scenarios of do I do FHA? Do I do conventional? Well, rates had gone down so much that we talked through it all and ended up doing conventional 15 years. Mm-hmm. Because my interest rate was so much higher, mm-hmm. didn't even I think it changed my. Payment. I remember I that back, back then. Uh, yeah, you got a real big break on the fifteen year. Like the fifteen year now is the, is the same as yeah. a thirty. But it was such a huge break to do a fifteen yeah. year conventional. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and those are the kind of things that you bridges just, that you'll cross when you call in first. Yeah, and I think that if you're interested in refinancing or you know if you're interested in purchasing a home, I think that call to blame yeah give me a call be able to look at what's the best options and yeah you know. what's your website blame oh i don't know what Okay. Uh, I'm sure like, your phone number. How do we get in touch with Blaine if we need to? Uh, 405-408-4252. Blaine Holtz. Cross Country Mortgage. Um, okay. I guess yeah. what? what? I'm prepared. Oh, you are. We'll let you go first then. Okay. So, Blaine, we played this little game that we didn't make out of. We inherited it, which is she's going to say three. She's going to say a word. It can be a person, place, or thing. And uh, we, I have to say whether it's overrated, underrated, or just right. And then a little explanation, and we'll let you participate. Oh, okay. So let, we'll let you go first. Okay, we're going to start with discount points. Discount points. <laughs> I think at this moment, they are overrated. They are very overrated. I think that, you know, part of the idea is like when you buy a home with with everything we're talking about, with the closing costs, with hospital down payment, all these things, it's like, man, we're adding to that pull of money that has to be brought up. up Right. Well, especially right now, you're going to refinance when the interest rates drop. Why would we pay for discount points right now? Yeah. Yeah. Some are really uh, selling the... uh, Refi, you know, they yeah. want to refi just just to get some cash out of the house. I mean, it, lots of the banks that have HELOCs, those are all in-house products that they keep in-house. They, and they all handle them differently. It's, you know, so you shop around. If you just needed some money, a little bit of money, I wouldn't do a full-fledged refi unless you're going to drop rate or maybe even need to get a big cash out, you know, $10,000, 15000 Blaine, we're just keeping it short. Overrated, underrated. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, discount points are overrated. So we all agree. They're overrated. Well, you know, they're well, for a two hundred thousand dollars house. It's two thousand dollars, and you dropped it a quarter. Right. That's that, not worth yeah. it. Overrated. Over, everybody agrees. Overrated. Okay. <clears throat> and we we'll stay in the holiday spirit. Okay. It's almost New Year's Eve. So mm-hmm. New Year's Eve parties. New Year's Eve parties. Actually, it's funny you brought this up because I'm going to say underrated. 
Oh. And it's because I can't remember the last time I went to a New Year's Eve party. And I put that in line with Halloween party, because if you recall, uh, we were talking about Halloween before Halloween. I said, it'd be cool to have a yeah. dress up, you know, adult um, Halloween party. Yeah. Um, I've actually never been to one. I'd like to. And so I think the same way as New Year's Eve. I think that. Oh, you're missing out. Underrated. Is okay. What I say. I'm going to say Underrated. I could get uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to stick with the old, um, you know, New Year's night is amateur night. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? It's overrated. I mean, that's a, that's the amateur drunks out getting DUIs. Yeah. Oh no, it doesn't yeah. mean you have to go somewhere. Oh, you stay home. Well, you say it over yeah, I, I would just, I would that's agree with the time. stay home, but that's what when, growing up. That's what we always called. New Year's Eve was amateur night. <laughs> that's that is funny. Yeah, that is. Okay. NFTs. NFTs. All right. So you're not. I'm going to definitely say NFTs. If you guys don't know what that means, you can Google it. But non-functional, I think. uh, Functional. Transaction. Yeah. And I definitely say underrated. I've been on this subject for quite a while. If you look at the experts like in social media, in investment, in business, most of the experts, if you take Joe Rogan, number one podcast in the world, he has had many guests over NFTs. NFTs is definitely underrated. It is a big deal that's going to happen in the future. I think it's one of those things that it's real easy to bury your head in the sand and say, I don't believe in it. But I think that it's worth everyone literally going and educating themselves over it. And the experts say 50 hours, educate yourself 50 hours on that subject. But I think it's worth it. I overrated. <laughs> Oh, just because she heard me talk about it. I I'm not going to educate myself. 50, 50 I, hours. That's a lot. Yep. That no. I I studied ninety hours in order to become a realtor. So I don't as think you 50, should. But I think this can make be way better. Thank than goodness this. you know about it then. All right. The what do you think, Blaine? Well, it's an NFT. See, yeah. This is how well, most non-functional. People. Transmission. It's non fungible. Ask, ask about what you use this to is buy. buy. It, what, what it means. What do you you're buying digital items. It's basically it's a, it, digital. It's a digital contract. Yeah, it's it's a basis digital. right now. They're... By the way, mark my words, we're recording this. This is good because in the future, mortgages are going to be NFTs. Oh mark my, my gosh, words. we're going to be selling houses with NFTs. Yep. For no. sure. It is like it, another way to say it that you can definitely relate to, Blaine, is that it's like digital real estate. Yeah, uh, we're definitely that's heading. That's on why that path. I think I mean, that, we have electronic closings now. We didn't when we started. I mean, the, the closing lasted an hour and a half or something when we started because they'd have to sign a hundred pages. Now, ninety-five percent of your closing docs are signed electronically. That's not with all lenders. Oh, it's I know. <laughs> it's not right now. It is Thank with the majority. You are. But yeah. they're getting there. Yeah, they're and getting there. now we're coming up with electronic notaries. Uh, you know, is an electronic notary. Yeah. I mean, we're not even going to have to go to closing Amazing. before long. Good, because people stuff. don't want to show up anyway. All right. right. Ready? Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. What do you All have? right. So first one, this is as investment. Rental properties as an investment. Um, I mean, I think they're underrated. I, I, of course, believe real estate is always a great investment. And then the older I get, I'm definitely more into, like, diversify. Mm-hmm. So, so underrated? I think they're, like, underrated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's your thoughts, Paul? Yeah, I think they're underrated. Um, I don't know. A lot of people, I get a lot of calls from investors, mm-hmm. um, you know, trying to get into it. And I don't suggest that. I did that myself. This is the lesson I learned with investment properties. You know, back when I did, I did an 80-20. Mm-hmm. on an investment property and got into it for nothing, you know, but the thing, it, it, there's no money. I wasn't making money monthly on it because I didn't yeah. put any, any anything down and I was getting, and they want something fixed every month. And I got sick of it and sold it. Yeah. I think you do an investment property, you put 50% down at least so that you can make some money at the end of the month. I think like the key to investment property is like you need to buy a property that needs to be fixed up and you yeah. do the work and that kind of stuff mm-hmm. and you put your own equity into it. Yeah. Sweat equity. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is underrated. I told you that I got really burned out on rental properties because I own, you know, quite a few rental properties and now I'm struggling with repairs. I was struggling with um, people paying the rent. And, but part of that I realized through time away from it was that it was, 
it needed better management from me. Yeah. yeah. I think that if I had done better management, property management, then I wouldn't have had all those struggles. Mm-hmm. I think because I was working out of town a lot and, right. and whatever. So I think that if I had to do it over again, that it could be a lot better situation. Yeah. I learned a lot online was, too. If I was more involved. I ran, across, but, I ran across a guy and his in-laws were doing this. They had put, you know, big money down on the, and they had 18 investment properties and all section eight of them. They put section eight renters in them. And so they get this enormous check at the end of every month and they hire a property management company to take care of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you can't do that if you did them all at a hundred percent financing. You know, they're making some money each month off each one of them. Yeah. And they can hire a property. I mean, they did travel the country and get this big check. Every, right. Cause then the property management. Yeah. Like the property management's taking care of it rent. and they have equity in it. Yeah, they're collecting the rent. They're doing the repairs. Yeah. yeah. I know you're answering this, and I might have asked this before, but I'm going to ask it again because you and I have talked about it so many times. But um, Zillow. Mm. <laughs> Sets me off. It's so overrated. <laughs> but I, I'm forced. I feel like I'm just forced to do it. How do you, you know, the reason I ask the question is because I'm very curious coming from your point of view. If a consumer, um, how do they educate themselves and be able to find things that are on the market themselves? What, you know, because that's what Zillow is for, for them to look up right. properties. And what what do you think the difference? Ignore the numbers. I mean, right. look at the houses right. only. Exactly. They're lying on the numbers. Because it's very misleading. Like, oh, the, the, Zil- the Zestimate, it's not a word. Because they, <laughs> the house is worth this. They, Zillow doesn't it know it that. It sounds like a spice. You put your food. It's zesty. Yeah. So, you know, we have apps. We can share the houses with you that are directly from the MLS, which mm-hmm. is where we input all of our listings to. Every one of us can share that with you. And it's a real time feed. Yeah. So, I mean, we talk to the professional. So you're saying like, underrated? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Overrated. <laughs> it's overrated. Sure yeah, yeah. Zillow's way overrated. <laughs> way overrated. Yeah. I mean, it is cool to do the open houses, have the open house on the buyer can go on and see where all the open houses are in the city and go look. We can those. do that too. Yeah. Yeah. But, I love it. I, I, I mean, Zillow's trying to make money like we all are. I mean, I don't knock them for that. Yeah. It's just not accurate. It's, it's so misleading. Yeah. Pre, pre foreclosure. Oh, minute. oh, is that house for sale? No. No. Zillow's lying to you. <laughs> I the next the last and well, what do you think? I, I I agree with you. It's overrated. I've seen a lot of problems already with it in my short real estate career. I think that mainly what you said about the numbers that they're you know those estimates are not you know they're not accurate. Yeah, I think it's easy. Plus, I do think it throws in another problem for realtors, which is. This house is listed by this realtor, so I'm going to call them. This house is listed by this realtor, I'm going to call them, which is another realtor. And the problem is, is if you just continue to do that, whether it's through Zillow or on your own, that you never actually have that advocate for you to help you through the buying process. And I can see how that that will be a problem. Yeah. Because if I'm just contacting every single realtor that listing every single house, then I don't ever find somebody who's really wanting to be my advocate. And I think that real, if you had to use a word for realtor, what they should be is your advocate. And that that mm-hmm. takes away almost that advocate, advocacy. I like it. Okay. Yeah. Last one is logos. And what I mean by that is like business logos. What is your Brandy. thoughts on logos? Branding's another word, yes. Um, I definitely think underrated. I am huge into the branding. Huge. Yeah. What I'm not huge into is you do not brand your full name. It has been a nightmare changing it. Because just if you're a female or just in general? You ever plan on changing your name? It's a nightmare. Yeah. I think it's underrated. Like I went through a thing here recently. I was forced to change mortgage companies. Yeah. You know, that company decided to go. He, the owner, retired. Mm-hmm. And uh, it had it wreaked havoc on my career, and I've spent a lot of time making my career, and that was something I didn't have control over. And now it didn't make me a worse loan officer, mm-hmm. you know. And so but it does uh, cost you money. The brand, yeah, I had a good name. I still do. 
you know, but it just, I wish that hadn't happened. And it was just, um, you know, the logo thing. Um, it, it was a, it was a hard time for me. I'm still recovering from it, mm. you know, and it, it's just, uh, I have to rebuild. Yeah. I got to rebuild now. So you think overrated logos? Underrated. Underrated. What yeah. do you think? I think it is underrated. I do want to say one thing about it, though. I think it, I hear a lot of people asking, they've asked me for advice, like, hey, this is my logo. This, you know, I'm starting this business. And this is what I'm thinking about for my logo. And I see they almost use it like a analysis, a paralysis analysis. And what I mean by that is like, I'm not going to start my business until I get my logo perfect. I'm not going to start this until uh, I get everything perfect. I'm never going to make hats or shirts or whatever, because I need my logo to be perfect. And, I, and to me, that's almost laughable. It's go, go start your business, develop the logo as time. Cause I think a logo and it, and you talk about the, one of the, some of the most popular companies um, in, in highest level, they have changed their logo. Yeah. In other words, change that logo as your company changes, change it as you grow Change it as you come into more insight and maybe you find your niche in that, yes. you know, you say, okay, this is where we're really going to focus because we figured out it was a niche. Yeah. You know, well, country, I might want to change my logo in yeah. that case. United Country has changed their logo, I think, three times since I've yeah. been here. I think if you allow it to to do that paralysis and keeps you from doing work, doing stuff, wow. doing business that you say you can do, then it is definitely overrated. But if it, you know, I think that it's, underrated in the fact that it's nice to be able to associate this image or this thing yeah. with me and I'm able to grow that. A, a logo should enhance what you do. It should be make you more well-known. It's like your name. It should be something that makes people want to know more about you and your company. But if you keep, if you allow that to keep you from doing work, then it's a bad deal. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, All right, Brian. I agree with that. Thank you so much for taking the yes, time to visit you. with us. We uh, are going to have to get Kathy out. I think. We love your insight. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I love to have Kathy. One more well, time. I, I was thinking, I don't know if to enjoy it, you know. Yeah. One more time. Um, put, uh, tell us your phone number or oh. whatever way they can contact yeah, you. Yeah, um, 405-408-4252. And you can go to myccmortgage.com slash Blaine Holt. It's got <laughs> yeah. a space in it, doesn't it? In between Blaine Holt. It's got a little <laughs> thing in the middle. What do you call that? You have dash. a glasses problem like I do. That is, that is a big problem. It's a dash in between Blaine Holt. myccmortgage.com slash Blaine Holt. Blaine dash Holt. Blaine dash Holt. Yeah. And I'm going to, since we did that, I'm going to put a little um, whatever. I'm going to put something out there for us, too, because uh, many of you got blamed. You need to have your people listen to our podcast. We're really trying to grow this podcast. I think that it's not just about listening to it, but it's also following it. It's reviewing is nice that way that we know that people are listening. And we're trying to we're not only trying to promote the industry, but we're trying to promote people that are doing a good job in the industry. So if you guys are listening, please follow our podcast. Please review it and let us know. I mean, you that are more than, yeah, um, let us know how we're doing and if we can you. do something better. Or there's a subject that you would really like to for us to discuss, then we will be happy to discuss that. Yeah. Um, you can always email us at stacycarnes at yahoo.com. <laughs> I wonder if we could do it and have buyers call in with questions. That, I, I actually love the call-in idea because I've tried to do it before. Very difficult to do, but I think it's worth it because we're not live. You'd have to be live, but I would love to do it. I think that people can email questions to Stacy, and then we can discuss those questions. Uh, and I think it would prompt, yeah. it, it would be interesting to see what people want to hear about too. That's true. So. I like it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys. I hope you thank you, Blaine and Stacy. Thanks, bro. Y'all have a great day. Thanks.